Welcome to this Salute Douglas Lecture event. Uh, thank you all for coming out on such a really nasty night uh, to see what is a terrific film. I think you'll be glad that you stayed. I'm Linda Teener. I'm the Executive Director at UFM Community Learning Center. Our lecture is named for Lou Douglas, who was a distinguished professor of political science at K-State from 1949 through 1977. Lou was one of the founders of UFM and was a board member and a volunteer up until his death in 1979. And so UFM chose to honor him with our lecture series. Uh, Lou was widely known for his power to inspire other people, faculty, citizens, students, and to instigate change and motivate grassroots organizations and individuals to pursue social justice in politics, economics, foreign policy, and even at the local level. Tonight's format is going to be a little different than our traditional lecture. Uh, we are actually going to be watching uh, the newly released documentary, Dolores. The, the filmmaker is here, and he'll be making some comments with you later. And what will ha what's going to happen is we're going to introduce Linda Duke, who is the co-sponsor of this program, uh, who will make some comments, and then we're going to see the film, and then Peter will answer questions and answers. So do think of questions that you'd like to ask. Uh, he's very engaging. He's very knowledgeable of his subject matter. Good for you. And uh, I think you'll enjoy the film and conversing with him afterwards. So before we begin the night, tonight's program, though, I wanted to invite Paloma Roman to the stage because she has a very interesting announcement to make. Hi, everyone. I hope you guys are having a good evening. Thanks for being here. I just wanted uh, to tell you guys that I have some really exciting news. Um, my name is Paloma Roman. I'm the current president of the Hispanic American Leadership Organization. And we're actually going to bring Dolores to K-State. So she will be here uh, March 30th. She's coming to K-State. Um, it will be in the Union Ballroom at 7 p.m., 7 to 8.30. So I just want to let you guys know, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. I actually just got to meet her last like week on a conference, and it's, it's awesome. So I'm really excited for you guys, and I hope to see you guys there. I think we're going to try to also show the film again as it gets closer right before or after if we can find space to do so uh, because I think that will expand the opportunities available to our campus. So now I'd like to introduce Linda Duke. She's the director of the Mariana Kistner Beach Museum of Art who's going to uh, introduce our program for the evening. Linda? Thank you, Linda. The Beach Museum of Art is really proud to be collaborating with the Lou Douglas Lecture Series and UFM Community Learning Center. So this is a great night. We're really thankful that filmmaker Peter Brott was willing to come, especially in this weather. And um, he's looking forward to speaking with you after the film. So I'm not going to say very much about him right now, um, but I do want to draw your attention to a couple of things. One is that the museum will be screening one of Peter's other films, La Mission, a week from tonight. That's March 1st, 5.30 p.m. at the museum, always free. We don't have the greatest film viewing room in the city, but you can see some great movies there. So I hope you'll join us for that. And I also want to say that in addition to this opportunity to collaborate, we're really pleased that this program is part of a campus-wide initiative called Living Democracy, where we are exploring listening to the voices of lots of people and getting together and actually having dialogue with people who may have a different perspective than ourselves. Um, artist Linda Pollock, who is seated right here, is here with us from Los Angeles. She has come to the campus to help us curate uh, that program. And um, it's sort of centered right now around a wonderful student exhibition in the Union Gallery called Living Democracy in Print. 
So check that out and look online at livingdemocracy.info or under the KS Unite website, and you'll find lots of fascinating programs. And so with that, I think we should watch our film. Thank you. Go ahead. How you doing? Thanks again for, uh, for sitting through and watching the film. I'll tell you a little bit of, uh, give you a little background on the film, and then I'll go ahead and turn it over to you if you have any, uh, any questions. Um, I come from a narrative feature film background, but I got a call five years ago, just like in a movie. <laughs> it was Carlos Santana, the great musician, and he said, we got to tell the story about Dolores while she's still with us. And I said, Carlos, I have no experience making a documentary. He said, like I said, we have to tell the story while she's still with us. And so he put a stake in the ground. He said he would fund the film, which that never happens in the independent film world. Uh, usually it takes me f anywhere from five to seven years to raise money for, uh, for a motion picture. And uh, Carlos put up, uh, uh, he put up a million dollars. And we started uh, what would eventually take five years to make the film. And, uh, and at first Dolores was a little bit hesitant. She was, she was very nervous about being the subject of a, of a feature length documentary. It took some convincing, <laughs> about a year. <laughs> And, uh, and, then I, and then she also resisted when I told her I wanted to, um, to interview her, uh, her children. She has 11 children. And, um, and she agreed. And, uh, and last year we premiered the, the film at the Sundance Film Festival on, uh, on Inauguration Day. And suffice it to say that a lot of people were very discouraged that day in Park City, Utah. And when we went in after, uh, after the film ended, Carlos was there, Dolores was there, her children were all there, my co-producer partner Benjamin, my brother was there, our mother was there, and the, the theater elevated. And she, she literally got a 20 minute standing ovation. And people were crying, and there were a lot of young people in the audience, and um, her, her example and her work really was, was, the, was what people needed to hear at that particular time. And then uh, she was asked, the next day was the, the Women's March on, March on Washington, and there was a local march happening in Park City, and they asked Dolores to lead it, and she did. So uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a magical time. We, the film has since opened in theaters. It opened in theaters in, in September, and it, we just concluded theatrical uh, a week ago, and Dolores, and I have been tag teaming, traveling together all around the country to all those different states and cities where it's been playing. And we engage audiences and encourage them to, to get audiences to come. Um, and then uh, next month in March, the film is going to premiere on PBS nationwide on, in, on independent lens during the Women's History Month. And so literally uh, tens of millions of people will see her story. And hopefully, she'll, be, she'll become a, a, a better known figure. And with that, I'll go, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you if you have any questions. Don't be, don't be shy. So my question is, um, or the background behind my question, I work a lot with some of the documentary things that happen at K-State and some of the film things that happen at K-State. And my question to you, especially when you're working with someone this high profile and like something like that, what was First Contact like actually going and saying, hi, I want to do a documentary about you and your life and how you've impacted people? Like how do you, how is First Contact? <laughs> First contact, very dramatic way to put it. Um, uh, my mother is, is an activist, and she was involved uh, with the farm workers' struggle back in the 60s, and she was also part of the um, uh, Native American occupation of Alcatraz in 69 and the Wounded Knee Standoff in South Dakota, Pine Ridge Reservation. So my mom knew and interacted with Dolores, and I had been around Dolores as a, as a child, as well as, as Cesar. So I, I already had a connection with her, and then I knew a few of her children from, from college. So there was already a connection there. But it was, really, it was really, this was Carlos Santana's idea. And he and Dolores are very close. When he was just starting out, um, before he played Woodstock, 
He was, you know, he was a musician, and he used to do uh, benefit concerts for the Farm Workers Union, you know, before he was even discovered. So they go way back, and he calls Dolores uh, Mirena de Luz, my the Queen of Light. She's, you know, and so it was really, it was really his prompting, and uh, and then uh, I also had uh, Benjamin and I had a film out, La Misión, which. Uh, you may have heard of it. it's a feature film starring Benjamin, and uh, it, that was uh, that opened in theaters in 2009, and we were just about to open in Phoenix, and uh, and Latino activists had just called for a national boycott for any businesses or artists to to, to boycott um, coming to Arizona because of they had just passed uh, SB 1070, which was a bill that allowed police officers to pull over you if they suspected you of being uh, undocumented. Um, so we were, oh my God, you know, the distribution company just spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and, you know, do we cross the picket line, do we take our film? And so we called Dolores, uh, to get her, to get her counsel. And she said, oh, she says, not only do you have to go and open the film, but I'm going to go with you. And, and she came, she said, our, our people need something. They need to see and hear stories about themselves and they need something to lift them up. So I'm going with you. And so she came with us. And, uh, and so, you know, when I came to the project, there was already a relationship there. And, but I think it was really, it was really Carlos Santana who, who said, Dolores, we're going to do this. And, and she's like, okay, Carlos, you know, she's not going to say no. <laughs> You're not going to say no to Carlos Santana, man. And me also, I wasn't going to say no to Carlos and Dolores. I was like, okay, I haven't done a documentary, but I'm going to learn on the job, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, her, her oldest daughter passed away during the, during the making of the film. She was in her 60s. And, but all the other 10 children are alive and well, and um, they're all doing some kind of, you know, high-minded work. You know, one's an immigration attorney in Central Valley. Another's a doctor for a clinica serving immigrant um, communities. Uh, there's there are educators. One's the director of the YMCA um, in the inner city in Los Angeles. Uh, three of them run her foundation and do community organizing and outreach. Um, I mean, they're all really well accomplished, and they're really this incredibly tight and loyal family. They argue like all hell, <laughs> but they love like all you know like like nothing else. They're really really tight, and they were all at the, at the Sundance Film Festival. And, uh, and a few of them shared with me uh, personally that, that they were, because Dolores has never really been recognized. And they were just so, you know, they were in tears saying, I'm so glad that she's getting the recognition before she leaves. You know, because oftentimes people get the recognition once, the, once they're in the grave, like Cesar or even King. Um, and then, and then I think, you know, one of the daughters I became close to, Juana, and she was saying that she was carrying around so much resentment and not just towards her mom, but even towards, you know, people in the union. And she said the film just lifted that burden from her and, and the family. And so in some ways, the, the film has brought them, I think, closer in, in a bizarre way. But they're all really remarkable people. And I, I consider them my brothers and sisters, her children. And as Dolores would say, they're all very resilient. <laughs> Well, first I want to say thank you because I agree that it's important to highlight our heroes. It sometimes it feels like we don't have and not like many because nobody knows who they are. But um, 
I have a background in urban planning and design and now I'm in architecture, but it's like you don't want to lose that sense of social justice. And it seems like you've been able to channel that through film. And I was just wondering what kind of advice you could give to people that aren't in the direct field, but still want to be part of it. Because in a place like Manhattan and Kansas State, it feels like you're in a bubble and there's nothing you can do. But it can't be that way, I don't think. So. That's a great question. Um, uh, I did a presentation at, um, at Google in California, and uh, there was a young Latina who came from a farm worker family in the Central Valley, and the film brought her to tears, and she, and she got up and she felt so torn at that moment about being at Google, away from her family, away from her community, when her community in many ways are, you know, is under siege. And, uh, and I just I shared, a, a, you know, as a, as a dramatic writer, um, one of the one of the all, all writers read it. Joseph Campbell is here with Thousand Faces, you know, the hero's journey, and you know, uh, George Lucas modeled Star Wars, the trilogy, off of, of Campbell's work. But you know, the, the hero usually ha he has to leave the village, he has to leave the community, or she has to leave the community, and go out into the world and kind of hone his or her skills and do battle with the demons. And then once they, once they defeat the demon, they can return to the community with the boon, you know, with the medicine. And so, um, you know, I went away to college and graduate school and, you know, hone, hone the craft. And, you know, that took me away from my family, away from my home. Um, I got to study in Europe for a year. I went to graduate school in New York City. But then I came back with the skills I had acquired, and, and now I'm trying to do something with film. So there are so many different ways to participate in, in a democracy. You know, there's so many different ways, and this is just one of them. You know, this is one of many. My wife is a nurse. You know, she goes and volunteers at the, at the, at the clinics. And, you know, uh, I also work in the drug and alcohol field with, uh, with Native communities. And, um, and I get to work with, you know, traditional people from the different reservations, and that's how they contribute. But they're just, there's a myriad of ways that you can, you can give back, but definitely don't feel guilty about being here. And, and because this is, I know that my mother, who's an immigrant, and so many other in the, in the, in the community, they strive for their children to go and get a higher education. And so in no way, you know, we need that. We need more of that. But then once you have those skills, you, know, you come back and you, as Delors would say, you give back. And that has its own reward. You know? Yeah. Come on, Joyce. Okay. Come on, Joyce. <laughs> and am I speaking to you or to them? You're speaking to everybody. All right. What is the strength of the Farm Workers Union today? And should I still be boycotting grapes? Well, Dolores still boycotts grapes, unless they're organically grown. <laughs> um, I, I'm not an expert on the UFW. The UFW still exists, which is really amazing for an organization that was, that was started uh, over five decades ago. There are not many organizations that you can, that you can say that started that long ago that, that still mean something today. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the Farm Workers Union has dwindled in number. And its power and influence is, has also shrunk. But if you look around the globe, unions in general have, have declined. Um, and also, unfortunately, the conditions of farm workers today is, is relatively unchanged from what it was five decades ago. Um, there were, you know, Cesar and Dolores and the Farm Workers Union, the work that they did in the 60s and 70s really changed the conversation. Um, for instance, uh, they can no longer spray pesticides while people are actually working in the field, which that was a common practice before the farm workers. They would, sp they would just coat them and they would just have a bandana wrapped around their face. And a lot of people died, you know, because of that. Um, some pesticides were, were banned, but then they were replaced with, with others. And that's still an ongoing um, challenge. Um, you can go to any field, go by any field in this country, and you'll see a porta potty out in the field, and that's because of the farm workers. Before Dolores and Caesars started the union, there were no bathrooms. 
There were no water breaks. There was no shade. And in the Central Valley, you know, it gets up to 115, 120, and it's sweltering. And you're, you're driven way out into a field, and you're miles from, from anywhere. So oftentimes, farm workers had to go to the bathroom right there in the fields. If you were a woman, they just would hold up a towel or a shirt, and that was your bathroom. And there was no drinking water, and you couldn't bring anything with you to the fields. So some of those, some of those basic, those basic uh, rights were granted to farm workers, but, um, but they still are really a powerless class, and most of them are undocumented. And I think growers prefer to keep it that way because nobody wants to rock the boat if conditions are bad because they'll be deported. You know? And there still is a lot, there's also a lot of sexual abuse that goes on, rape in the fields. Um, that go, just goes unchecked, but but almost 90, 95% of all the food that we consume as Americans is is cultivated and picked by farm workers. Yeah. yeah. Dolores always tell, she tells a joke. She says, "If you were trapped on a desert island, who would you rather be with? A Harvard attorney or a farm worker?" <laughs> I want to say thank you for such a beautiful, sensitive film. And I wanted to say, you know, one of, some of the most powerful moments in the film are your interviews with the children, with Dolores' children. Um, you know, and you could see kind of the pain that when they recall when their mother is not there. And I, I felt that it really reinforced the idea of how, you know, there were many sacrifices to support her being able to do her work. That was, so it's just such a full picture that you're able to offer, and thank you for that. And I'm curious, you were saying um, how you got some, some resistance from Dolores about making the film, and I'm curious to, how did you convince her, you know, with her not wanting to be part of the film and all that? Uh, great question. Um, I mean, I, you know, Dolores says something in, in the film that you, you can't affect and make real and lasting change unless you give up something. You have to sacrifice something. And I think that's just a, that's one of the laws of life. You know, anyone who's a graduate student or gone to medical school, you've probably forgone a lot of parties and family gatherings because you have to be in the library, oftentimes depriving yourself of sleep to, to, to acquire those skills. But anything worthwhile is going to take sacrifice. And you could also take that to the spiritual level. And, um, and I think Dolores lives that and, and truly believes that to her core. And I think her children do, you know, do it too. Um, I think because she's a woman, it's, it, it, the, the lens is magnified because oftentimes men will, they will go off. You know, Muhammad, the Buddha, King himself, Gandhi, I mean, you go down the list, soldiers, great leaders, military leaders, a lot of our presidents who are male, have, you know, they also sacrificed time with their families. But I think it's, it's magnified in, in Dolores' case because she is a woman. Um, but I, I think uh, in terms of um, her resisting, it was, it was just so difficult for her to sit there and have me ask all these questions about her. You know, she really, really wanted the film. She's really uncomfortable being the center, and she wanted to really talk about uh, organizing and activism, and, and she really wanted to create like a manual. <laughs> and I just said, you know, that's going to be no one's going to see that movie. That's going to be boring, <laughs> you know. And so I, she, she, I had to really get her to to trust me. And it was ongoing, right up until the very end, that she had to trust me as a, as a storyteller. To, that those elements would come through, but it would come through her story and her struggle, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a human being. And then I also told her I wanted to ask her some difficult questions about her relationships with her three husbands. I wanted to, like, get in her business about her children and her regrets. And she said, well, why do you want to do that? You know, people don't want to care about that. I said, yeah, people do. You know, I mean, one of the first things people would say, oh, my God, she had 11 children? And that's what they want to hear about. Because everybody comes from a family, everybody has a mother, you know. A lot of people have brothers and sisters, so people hook on to that right away. And then in the Latino culture, you know, we don't, 
identity is not just, it's not tied up in the individual. You really are, you know, your family. Your, your primary relationships, that's also your identity. And so I really felt strongly it had to be a family story. And so, um, I, you know, I said this earlier, when I, when I have my director's hat on, I, I'm like, I'm not intimidated by Dolores at all, you know. But me as Peter, who, who goes back with her and has a relationship with her, you know, I'm, I'm terrified of her. And I, you know, I would joke with her, God, I, hope, I hope we're still friends after, <laughs> after this process. And, you know, we're, I think we're closer than ever. Because after she saw the, the film and how, it, how it's like impacted people, you know, particularly young people, um, she's like, wow, you were right. You know, like the power of the story, the narrative, you know, storytelling. You know, and, and I think she's, she's kind of seen that. And, and she's been going all over with the film. future young organizer right here. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you so much. Like, this makes me so emotional in, like, a great way. I don't even know why I'm crying right now. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for making a film on her because a lot of us don't, don't know history like this. And it's incredible to see the media portray Dolores this way because a lot of times, you know, Latinas don't get portrayed this way. And so it's just really inspirational. And I guess my question to you is, um, you know, other than Dolores Huerta and all her, you know, work done, have you ran into any other, you know, unspoken heroes or do you have any future films that you want to do on anybody? But yeah, thank you so much for doing this film. And you don't have to apologize for getting emotional. It's, it was, it's emotional for me every time I watch the film. And it was emotional for me during the making of the film. And the reason why it's emotional is because our people have struggled and we're still struggling. You know, I, I come from a long line of, you know, we're indigenous people. My mom's from a small pueblo, you know, and, and she, you know, has been, like Dolores, she says in her, in her there's a monologue, she's, you know, her, her great-great-grandfather fought in the Civil War. You know, she's still considered a foreigner by many. And so, you know, the struggle continues and that's why it's emotional because it, it kind of, when you see something on the screen like that, it legitimizes your family struggle, you know, which goes back centuries. So I feel like there's no need to apologize for being, I'm glad that you f feel that, the, the pride, and it's sometimes it's, it's, you cannot even articulate it. Um, so for that reason, Dolores' story is really, really important to me personally, um, because I still have relatives who are struggling and are invisible. And, uh, you know, um, when I heard uh, there, there's a monologue that we found in an old radio interview. And, uh, you know, she's, she's talking about, it's, it's at the, I think it's the one probably, the one time in her life where she's just full of doubt and regret. And it was shortly after uh, four people were killed in the field. There was a young farm worker, he was shot in the heart. Another one was shot in the head, point blank. And they, you know, they, the, the people who killed these farm workers were never held to account. And at that point, Caesar and Dolores, they, were, they really didn't know if they would, should carry on and put any more people at risk. And so it was really a turning point for the union. And in, in, in this radio interview that we found that we put in the film, she talks about having you know, this great great grandfather who fought in the war and how as a kid, you know, she, she thought she marveled at, at democracy and the constitution and that you know, people can get together and they can vote and they can make change and isn't this marvelous? And then, you know, she came to find like, that's, that's not true, you know? And, um, and then she says, you know, she realized at that, po at that point in time, she would never be an American. And, and there are a lot of people that feel that way even today. And, I, and then when I heard that, it just it resonated with me because I, I'm also an American. Um, but sometimes I, you know, I feel like, I'm not, <laughs> because I, I, I can't. So uh, when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, we gotta put that in the movie. And, uh, and of course, Dolores doesn't feel that way today, you know, and, um, you know, 
I'm, I'm just so happy that her story is, is coming out, and I, I really hope that tens of millions of people do see it. And, you know, we called her, we started calling her like the Forrest Gump of activists, <laughs> of activism, because really she's, she's had interaction with some of the greatest figures of the 20th century. And, and, and a number of them didn't even make the film or are not even mentioned in the film. Um, but her work is just, it's, it just, it spans seven decades, it's still going. And, um, and we, this is just like the shorthand version. You know, this is a 90 minute film. It really, it could have been a six hour film. You know, but that's, that's the breadth of it. And, and also Dolores is still stricken from the historical record. The, um, the initiative that was um, voted upon by the, by the Texas School Board, it stands today. Yeah. I'm sorry? Oh, in, in the film, you saw the, um, the Texas school board. They were voting on whether or not to keep, to remove Dolores Huerta from the school's curriculum. And Texas has the largest school district in, in the country. So as Texas goes, so does the country. And so the textbooks that they vote on get supplied everywhere throughout the country. So they, they voted her out of the curriculum, social studies in, in history. And so that's, that, that motion stands today. So she's literally, she's literally, you know, written out. I wanted to know if you could say something about the idea of hero. And where I'm coming from is that, to me, one of the things that characterized Dolores' leadership is that she was a facilitator. She didn't have to have the spotlight, as you said, although she got in it, but she made things happen. She facilitated that. And I think that's a leadership skill and even a heroic skill that's not valued. And I've thought a lot about how if things are ever going to change, our culture needs to question what is a hero? What makes a person a hero? Is it just through, you know, violence? Is, is, is that someone who achieves victory through violence or besting others in a very big, obvious way? What about people who make change happen without doing that, and I, I'd just love to hear your thoughts. I, I mean, I, I think Del Dolores is heroic, and, and she's, a fear she's also fearless, and she remains that way. And I think one of the things that made her just such a, such a compelling subject, she, she doesn't censor herself. <laughs> like, what you see is what you get. And, uh, and I would sometimes try to ask her these more esoteric questions about, you know, you're a hero, what does that mean to you? And can you tell me about, you know, Catholicism? Because she, she loves St. Francis, she loved Gandhi. And I think those were huge influences on her. Um, but she, she, did, she doesn't really like to theorize or philosophize. And she, she really has no time to talk about heroes or even heroics. She's, for Dolores, it's like, what needs to be done right now? And then let's roll up the sleeves and let's get busy. And, in, in, you know, forget, I don't care who the credit goes to, let's, let's get the job done. And, and it's really this very pragmatic and practical thing about her. And I, I think Caesar was more like the philosopher and, you know, contemplation. And, but Dolores still is, is about doing the work. And, uh, and she would... I would, you know, I'd ask her, you know, how, how do you, how do you find your leaders? And she says, well, you know, you, it's like a Tupperware party. You have a house party, a, um, a house meeting. You get the community together. What are the issues they're concerned about? You prioritize them, and then you ask for volunteers. You know, who's gonna, who's gonna help us achieve, you know, these goals? And then she says, the people who show up, those are your leaders. The people who show up and do the work. And it's, it's like it's really that simple for her. And, um, and, and she, she likens organizing to having a magic wand, you know, that you can go in 
and you can you can teach a community these give them these skills and then they they get elected to the water boards or the school boards and then they make change at the policy level and so it's it's a it's a slow grind but you affect real change and and they've done that everywhere you know that, that she's organized and it really is at the grassroots level it really is and yeah. Really are yeah i i agree So thank you so much for this film. This is the second time I, I saw the film, and it's so dense that I actually didn't get, I got the part of ethnic studies in Arizona, but it, I didn't, I'm so glad you articulated that, because I didn't get the fact that Texas wrote her out of, this, of the curriculum. But, and I'm thrilled that it's taking place uh, and I can attach living democracy to this film and your presence here, along with the week of Mary Beth Tinker, these icons. But my goodness, it sounds like it would be a great project for living democracy to, make, to start the effort of rehabilitating Dolores Huerta in Texas school curriculum. And I, and, cause I'm looking for projects, cause it would be really fun. Um, and meaningful. So I would, I would like to state this intention to the universe and to the United States of America and to Living Democracy and to the beautiful Kansas State University uh, to let's unpack that and check it out. And um, I'm going to be, my name is Linda and I'm so thrilled to be here with the Living Democracy Project. And you can find me, I'm going to try to be every day at the Kemper Gallery at the Student Union where it's the beautiful um, collection of the students who made uh, beautiful screen prints with expressions. Um, but I'll be there, I'm trying to be there every morning between 10 and 12. So um, let's do it. I, I mean, I hope she does. I, I eventually, I, I believe she will be put back in the history books, but I, I would think that, that the United States of America would proudly claim this woman as their own because she really is an American original. She, you know, she, her family goes way back. Um, she was a brownie, she was a Girl Scout, she was a baton twirler, she wanted to be a professional dancer. Some of her biggest influences were the American jazz greats. In fact, this film, whole film got, uh, got jump started because her and Carlos Santana stayed up almost all night talking about jazz. Her favorite musician is Charlie Parker and his is Miles Davis, and, uh, and she's just like a jazz aficionado. And, uh, and, and those were all like huge influences on, on her makeup. And it, and it happened here, it was incubated, it, it grew, it, it started, originated in you know, the soils of America. And so uh, she's a remarkable American, and I hope that she's, she's eventually reclaimed. Hi, my name is Liz Seaton. I work at the Beach Museum. Um, I was really um, interested in your presentation of her entrance into the feminist movement of the period or her decision to recognize horse, herself as a feminist, I guess you would say maybe. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that um, and maybe your interview with Gloria Steinem and just a little bit more about that. Because it resonates me, with me um, as sort of someone who has m been a participant in the Women's March and, I, and some of the coverage, uh, there are just discussion about the divisions among the women in the march, which I sometimes think is almost concocted and false, as you mentioned, and, and that same thing was happening at the time. And so I thought it was great that you recognized that. Yeah, to, to me that was the one of the more interesting um, aspects of making the film, um, and then also interviewing Angela Davis and Gloria. Um, I think when Dolores set out to New York in 1966 to lead the New York boycott, her her primary identity was as a Chicana. You know, was as was as you know a Mexican American. It was, you know, she was identified through, through race and culture. 
And I think it was when she went to New York and she started realizing, you know, she was around people like Gloria and Eleanor Schmiel and they were talking about the feminization of power, um, that a light bulb went on in Dolores' mind. And, and she, rec she started to recognize herself as also a feminist, as well as a Chicana. And, um, and then also Gloria and Angela also talked about in, in, the, in the first and second wave of the women's movement that it was largely led, as Angela stated, you know, the assumption was that if you're female, you were female white. And a lot of women of color were initially left out of the conversation. But, it, but as Gloria stated, it was really Dolores who helped kind of move that conversation forward. And now we're in the third wave. And, and, and I think you have, you have that integration. But I think it's, it's pioneers like Gloria, like Angela, like, like Dolores, who really, who really brought that inter, those intersections together. And you can, I mean, you can see it play out in her life. Um, you can see how environmental justice is connected to race and how race is connected to class and how class is connected to gender. And it's, you, know, you can see how they all interconnect. Um, and, and to me, her, her life is just, it's such an example of that intersection of, of struggles and identities. Um, and, I, and I think it, it just, it makes it, it crystallizes it. You know, because you hear a lot of people in the academy talking about intersectional activism, we have to build coalitions and work together. But I, I really do believe that um, the wisdom keepers, Angela, Gloria, and, and Dolores, they, they really did live it. You know, they really, really did. You know? and, and I mean, Dolores said it, King has said it many times, there's no social movement that could, that could be successful without coalition building. You know, there's, there's just no way. And that, but that's democracy at work. And with that, thank you so much for coming out on this uh, rainy night. Yes, on behalf of everyone here, thank you, Peter. I was, it's been an entertaining day. So thanks for coming and sharing with us. Um, I'd like to wrap up for the evening. As we go, I'd like to also announce that this is UFM's 50th anniversary year. And we are doing a number, well, thank you. We are doing a number of celebrations uh, throughout the year. So watch our catalog. There'll be a listing on the second page of the variety of things that we're doing all year uh, to thank the community because we could not be here for 50 years were it not for the community uh, participating in all the things that we do. And we are the facilitator to make that happen. So thank you all for coming out tonight. And I hope I'll see you again soon. <laughs>